I'd like to begin by showing you a happy user. And this user is very happy sitting there using a workstation. And this workstation has everything that a user could possibly want. It's got C, it's got Fortran, it's got Unix, maybe it's even got Lisp. And uh, it has everything that one could desire, except for one thing, which is that the workstation is a little bit small, and it can only handle small problems. And this user would like to compute on big problems. So we're going to fix that. What you need in order to work on a big problem is a big memory. So we are going to give this user a big memory. How about 32 gigabytes? That's a good start for main memory. And now we have a very happy user that can compute on very big problems, except that he's got a von Neumann bottleneck. There's a big memory, but there's still only a very tiny processor there. And the computer can't process the data effectively because it's got to get at the data one word at a time through that bottleneck. So we're going to fix that. We're going to add processing power to the computer system to match the memory. So let's put on, say, 128 gigaflops of processing power. And I've made a decision here in this slide that's somewhat arbitrary that I need to justify later. I've shown the memory as having been divided up into pieces so that I put a, a processor on each piece of memory. That's a decision I have to justify later. But for now, let's assume that. So we divided the memory up into lots of chunks. We've still got the same 32 gigabytes. And we've got a bunch of processors. And uh, now instead of having one von Neumann bottleneck, we've got a whole lot of them. You know, and that's not to be ignored, but at least we've made the bottleneck a lot wider. And now the user is real happy because there's a lot of memory and there's a lot of processing power to operate on all that data, except the processors can't get at each other's data. Each processor can get at its own data, but not at each other's. So that's a problem. And we'll fix that by putting on a really good network that provides 5 gigabytes per second of, uh, of routing power so you can move data among the memory so that each processor can get not only its own data, but also the data throughout the system. And now we have a very happy user, except that multi-way cooperation is slow and awkward. Imagine me giving this talk to you instead of by standing here and broadcasting. I talk and everyone listens at once. Suppose we had to do this by telephone. Okay, so I could phone up, say, you there in the first row, and I could tell you my whole talk. And then you could call up two other people and tell them my talk. And then each of them could call up another couple of people. And that would work. In fact, it would only take logarithmic time instead of linear, because I've carefully organized this as a binary tree. But it would still take a fair amount of time. And it's much more effective for this kind of communication from one person to many people to broadcast, have one guy talk and everybody listen. And this computer can't do that. So we're going to fix that by adding another kind of network with very different capabilities from the network that was designed to move big piles of data around point to point. We're going to add a control network. And it's designed to be multi-way, maybe a thousand ways, so that it can talk to all the processors at once. And it's designed to have low latency, so you don't, so you don't take a lot of time relaying data from processor to processor. So that solves that problem. And now we have a happy user, except that now the problem is that I.O. takes forever. We've got a system where you can get a lot of data in the system, and you can process on it in crunch. You can't get any answers out. It's actually hard to get the data in in the first place because there's an I.O. bottleneck here where the von Neumann bottleneck used to be, with all the I.O. still going through this workstation. So that's no good. And we do want to keep the user happy. So we will put on I.O. attachments at a different place in the system. In fact, a good place is to stick it onto this data network that's designed for high bandwidth in the first place. So we've got lots of I.O. connections here. And you can connect up to all kinds of things, to VME and to CMIO and HIPI and SBDI and all that stuff. And now the user can hook up lots of I.O. devices to the computing system. And now the user is very happy, except that now the poor workstation is overburdened just trying to manage this huge system. It can't manage all of these processors and all the I.O. that's going on. It has become the bottleneck again because of its processing power rather than because of its I.O. capacity. Every time you add something on, something goes slightly out of whack and you have to correct for it, it seems. So we'll correct for this one by putting some more control processors in the system so the workstation doesn't have to be the only one in charge of things. We'll add some I.O. control processors into the system there. And these I.O. control processors can be in charge of managing the I.O. devices while this workstation up here manages the computing that's going on in here. And that works out to be a reasonably balanced system. And now the user is very happy, but the user's colleagues aren't happy. The colleagues want to share in this wonderful big system. And maybe they'll even share in the cost if they get to use it, which would be a good thing for the user, because we've built a fairly big system here. 
So the way we're going to fix that is pro to provide a way to attach more users to the system. Now, I'll, I'll save a couple of steps here. What we're going to do is move the workstation that's controlling all the processors. We're going to move it into the middle of the system and then hang Ethernet off of it. And that allows the user to use the system plus all the colleagues. Now, we've got a bunch of people here using the system. And they're connected by Ethernet into this control processor. And now we have a lot of happy users, not just one happy user. Almost. They're happy, except that some of them need dedicated resources within the machine. Just time sharing the machine isn't good enough. Sometimes one user needs a particular bunch of processors or a particular I.O. device, uh, perhaps wants to time a program and needs dedicated resources to make sure nothing else is interfering. So we'll fix that up by providing for dividing the system into pieces when appropriate. In order to do that, we're going to need several of these control processes in here so that different ones can be dedicated to managing different parts of the system. So these four users here are using this part of the system under the control of that control processor. And this user here has a dedicated chunk of the system over here under the control of another control processor. And now everything is wonderful and perfectly balanced. We have happy users because they're using a CM5 from Thinking Machines Corporation. So now I'd like to turn to a different question, which uh, some people have come to me over the last year is, uh, asking me, which is, this machine is very different from the CM2. Why, was, why is it so different? I thought we were a SIMD company. And my answer to that is we are not a SIMD company. And indeed, the CM5 is very different from the CM2 at the lowest level. But at the highest level, it reflects the continuity of our goals. And I claim that our, the goal of thinking machines is to help customers deal with big problems rather than our goal being to build a particular kind of hardware. Our goal is to help customers solve big problems, problems with big data that require big memory and big processing power and big I.O. bandwidth. We're trying to solve all these problems of bigness. And if, if solving those problems in the large also scales down to the small, so much the better. And I think we've achieved that. We do whatever makes sense with the technology and expertise available. Several years ago, when we designed the CM1 and the CM2, there was a different set of technology available, and the engineers in this company made different design decisions. This year, different technologies are available, and then the decisions are made yet again differently, but all in pursuit of this overall goal. We are not a SIMD company. We're not a MIMD company. And this is going to sound a little rah-rah, but I'm going to claim that we are, or should try to be, a solutions company. We're not dogmatic about SIMD. We're not dogmatic about hypercubes. We are not dogmatic about one-bit processors. Our goal is to deliver useful, cost-effective solutions to big computing problems. And we should do whatever it takes to make that happen. Nevertheless, people do insist on trying to categorize products and companies according to a very simple set of buzzwords rather than according to rather abstract goals, partly because that makes it easy to, make, to divide things into columns and charts and print things in, in newspapers and things in a very simple, summarized way. And so, in fact, the CM2 is often ca categorized as, oh, that's the machine that's a bit serial SIMD hypercube. And those are all true attributes of the CM2. But I submit to you that that's a bit like the classic characterization of a human as a featherless biped. It's true that if you consider the sets of things represented by the buzzwords and intersect them, that the CM2 is the only thing left in that category. It's sort of the only machine that's bit serial and SIMD and, and hypercube. And yet I think that doesn't cap capture the essence of its purpose. Similarly, about the only things that are both featherless and bipeds are humans and kiwi birds and plucked chickens. But somehow that characterization doesn't capture the essence of any of them. <laughs> Nevertheless, for your amusement, I have uh, written down a similar characterization of the CM5. The CM5 is a distributed control, partitionable, centrally controlled, risk tree structured, MIMD, hypertree connected, risk bus connected, SIMD software pipeline, VLIW hardware pipeline vector processor with all kinds of I.O. connections. <laughs> and this is a true, accurate characterization of the hardware and its facilities from top to bottom. And it would appear that we've used almost every hardware technique in the book. Uh, I, I used to remark we've used every hardware technique I can think of except data flow. But it's recently come to my, intention, to my attention that some people have been designing data flow compilers targeted to the CM5, and it looks like it's going to be pretty good. So, uh, so I'm not even going to disclaim that one. It's a very rich, very complex system, and every one of these things has been put in for a reason. And it's important to understand the underlying reason and not just look at the list of buzzwords. This kind of a design would be crazy if there weren't some underlying unifying framework. Can you imagine taking a description of this hardware, as I just showed you on the previous transparency, and going to a compiler writer and say, here, write a compiler for this machine. You know, and he would 
uh, quickly head for the loony bin. The data parallel model is the framework that keeps this whole thing together. It turns out the machine is good for other things besides the data parallel model, but that was the unifying vision when the design was first undertaken. So to understand the data parallel model, I'd like to revert to some more philosophy and ask ourselves, ask why certain things got done the way that they were done. In fact, let's go back to the most basic question. Why are we building massively parallel computers in the first place, rather than some other design? And this was a question that we seriously reconsidered when the design of the CM5 was undertaken. And the answer is that given today's technology, the technology of five years ago and the technology of today, the massively parallel designs are the most cost-effective way to deliver high-performance solutions. Because you can ride on the back of other technologies, because you can use off-the-shelf memories and processors and other parts, instead of having to design exotic parts that are much more expensive for the amount of performance they deliver. So making things massively parallel is just the most cost-effective way to go. Now let's go to back to that question that I said that I deferred in the early part of the talk. Why distributed memory computers? Why not keep the memory together and solve that problem for the programmer and just have lots of processes all acting in the same memory? Well, there's an engineering reason and a co correlated practical observation. The engineering reason is that it's very hard to build a switch that gives every processor equal access to all parts of the memory. It's very hard to build such a switch. And if you try to build a shared memory machine, that switch is on the path between every processor and every memory on every memory reference. And so it's got to be very fast. This means an expensive solution. But the empirical observation is that most applications exhibit some kind of locality that you can exploit. Most applications can be organized so that most of the time, most processors only need to get at data that's in their chunk of the memory and not another chunk. And so you can take advantage of the observed empirical statistics by instead of putting the switch between the processors in the memory, you put each processor next to its own memory and put the switch on the other side of the processors. That allows you a much more cost-effective solution on the design of that switch, on the design of that network. But then this has a consequence. It has a consequence of the software. Memory access costs will be non-uniform, and programmers are going to have to grapple with that fact. One more observation about parallelism. There are two different kinds of parallelism, and I think this is something that has not been brought out very well in the literature heretofore. There are two kinds, and I'll call them cooperative and competitive parallelism. And with cooperative parallelism, the problem is that there is a shared goal, and you're trying to bring disparate resources to bear on that shared goal, on that single problem. With competitive comp parallelism, the problem is that there are disparate goals, and there's a need to use a shared resource in pursuit of those several goals, and the problem is that there's competition for that scarce resource. The observation is that the techniques and mechanisms for one kind of parallelism don't often scale well to the other kind. And this has led to a certain amount of thrashing in machine design and in explorations in the theoretical literature. In particular, techniques for competitive parallelism usually don't scale well. There's a very good theory of mutual exclusion mechanisms. Uh, they go in literature by names such as monitors and semaphores and spin locks and things like that. And these mechanisms work very well when you've only got 10 things competing for a resource. But the same protocols that allow 10 workstations to share a printer on a network don't work very well when you've got 1,000 workstations needing to share a printer. But if you have 1,000 of anything needing to do something, that itself becomes a big exercise in cooperative parallelism. They must cooperate simply in order to share the resource without wasting a lot of time. The CM5 architecture is explicitly designed to address both kinds of parallelism. And in different places in the architecture, we were constantly asking the question, is this a competitive problem or a cooperative problem? And that would usually lead us to the appropriate kind of solution mechanism. You'll see mechanisms for both kinds of problems throughout the CM5. And typically, what you'll see is that for mechanisms that operate within a single user task, they are designed to service cooperative parallelism, whereas the mechanisms that are designed to allow multiple users to share the system are of the competitive kind. Data parallel programming addresses primarily the cooperative kind of parallelism. This is a programming style that's appropriate for the writing of single user tasks. We need data parallel programming or something like it to help manage the complexities not only of parallelism, but of the problem of the non-uniformity of cost of memory access. Data parallel programming provides a coherent way of organizing a program globally from a global point of view so that they can operate effectively using thousands or millions of processors. Here, then, is the basic idea of data parallel programming. It's not merely sim programming. This is an identification that many people have made over the last several years. In fact, it's an identification that I made. 
several years ago. I thought the data parallel program and SIMD programming were just two names for the same thing. And actually, Jim Bailey was the one who unwedged me on that one and insisted that they were slightly different ideas. And uh, as we've learned through our experience within the company and, and in interactions with our users, they are different ideas. And the data parallel programming idea is significantly more general. It is an organizational principle for programs and not just the way you program SIMD architectures. And the idea is that program execution globally alternates between local execution and global execution. And that communication should be cooperative and not competitive. What it amounts to is that when the processors are not communicating, there is no reason for them to stay in lockstep with each other as they do in a SIMD architecture. When they're not communicating, each processor can go off and do whatever computation is necessary to carry out its portion of the workload. And it's OK if they branch to different parts of the program or, or execute do loops a different number of times, that kind of thing. It's only when processors communicate that they need to be synchronized. And when it is time to communicate by using global synchronization mechanisms rather than local point-to-point -point synchronization, you can get economies of scale in the communication operation to make the whole system as a whole more effective. You also have some empirical evidence that the data parallel model is, in fact, as general as I've claimed, and portable, not just among connect machines, but to a variety of other computers. Of course, we've had a lot of experience with that on the CM2, which is a SIMD architecture. But we've also seen users at other sites implement the data parallel model on vector machines such as Craze. An example of this is the Passwork package at SRC. We've seen it done on MIMD machines such as the N-Cube. I'm thinking of the port of the C-Star programming language to the N-Cube. Uh, by Quinn and Hatcher and his colleagues at the University of New Hampshire. And also back in 1988, Sandia made a big splash in the news by getting a tremendous speed up on a parallel processor, which was an n -cube. And they got it by organizing their computation in a data parallel style, constantly organizing, constantly organizing the program so that it alternated between local computations and global communication. Finally, we have the example of the crystalline operating system CROSS-3, which was done on the Caltech Hypercube by uh, Jeffrey Fox and others which is also a MIMD machine. And that was intended not so much to be an application. That was an operating system with a subroutine library for communications. And they designed what they thought would be a useful set of library routines for the writing of parallel programs on that architecture. And when Fox's book came out, volume one of the book on solving concurrent problems, I took a list of the, pro of the subroutine names in his program library and put them in one column. And then I took the names of all the Paris instructions from CM2 and put them on another column. And then I crossed out the lowest level communications primitives, which were rather different. And the rest of the names matched up one for one. I'm not kidding. It, it turned out that on these different architectures, very different groups of implementers driven by very different goals found the same sets of primitives at the next level of abstraction up to be the, the, the useful set of ideas for communication. So I'm going to make a further claim about the generality of the data parallel model. This is a somewhat bold claim. I think that the data parallel model may be for parallel programming what structured programming was for sequential programming back in the 60s and 70s. And by structured programming, I don't mean the, the bad image that it got of if you want to use a go-to in your program, you have to get your manager to sign a form and triplicate first. But rather, structured programming is a common set of expectations. It's a common set of strategies for organizing programs so that other programmers can read the code and understand it, and so the compilers can do a better job on the program. And the notion is very simple. There are things to be structured, primitive notions in your programs. I'll take those to be assignment statements. It also includes I.O. statements and other things. And then there's a standard set of strategies for composing them into bigger pieces. So if you need to do several assignments, then you string them out in order. And that's called sequencing, sometimes called begin-end, from the syntax that's used for that construct. And then besides sequencing, there's also some kind of conditional, a way of making a choice, and then also some way of doing a thing many times some kind of do loop. Here I've used while do as the example. And all of these composing primitives have an interesting property. They maintain an invariant on the assignment statements. The assignment statements have the property that when control flows in the top, it comes out the bottom. Control flows in the top, you do the assignment, and then you drop out the bottom. These composing primitives maintain that property. If you take a bunch of things and string them together in sequence, when control flows in the top, it comes out the bottom. When you come into the top of a conditional statement, the control may go this way or that way, but then it eventually comes together and drops out the same place. And the same is true of the do loop. So this is a property that you can depend on when reading the program. The control isn't going to suddenly jump to a wild place and make it hard to understand the program. And go to's tended to make things hard to understand, not only for people, but for compilers. Just the fact that we have standard ways of writing loops has advanced the state of compiler optimization quite a bit. 
Now, that's not to say that this is the only set of primitives you would want to use in writing your programs. They're not necessarily convenient for all purposes. You might want additional primitives that are either like them that maintain the same property or that are a little bit more complex and provide another level of abstraction. So for example, instead of just while do, you might want something like the Fortran do loop that helps you by stepping an index variable along as you loop. That's a very convenient thing that happens a lot. Instead of a simple binary choice in the if then else, you might want a case statement that could do a multi-way branch. Uh, you might want to repeat until instead of while do. And you might want subroutines and some other things that don't quite fit this paradigm but still have that same one in, one out property. On the other hand, structured programming doesn't capture everything you might want to write in a program. It just captures a lot, but not all of it. There are some things that don't fit well in the structured programming paradigm. Two examples are coroutines and interrupts that simply aren't captured by this methodology. But that's OK. The fact that it covers most of the stuff most of the time is still extremely useful. And there are escape hatches in most programming languages that you can use if, if it's not covered by the set of standard primitives. And that's typically the go-to. If you suddenly need to make a fast error exit in the middle of a bunch of stuff, and if the go-to is there, you can grab it. And the very fact that you use go-to instead of one of the standard things serves as a strong flag that something unusual is going on. This is a warning to a maintenance programmer that, that uh, careful attention should be paid to what's going on. It's also flagged to language designers that maybe there's some important abstraction that wasn't captured. OK, so I've given you this big spiel about structured programming because I then want to make the analogy to data parallel programming. In data parallel programming, there are also things to be structured. And these are the local computations. And there's results. And what is being, being structured here is not flow of control, but flow of data, or structuring communications among the processes. And the proposal is that there is a standard set of, of primitives that seem to capture most of the kinds of communication that happen in most parallel programs. And these fall into the general categories of replication, reduction, permutation, and parallel prefix. Replication is starting with one data item and making a bunch of copies, like broadcasting, the way I'm talking to you now. I, I'm, I'm yelling out, and you're all getting copies in your brains of what I'm saying. OK, I'm sorry. I don't mean to get too mechanistic on you. Uh, you might also start with a few values and want to make a bunch of copies. For example, you've got a vector and want to get a copy to every row of a matrix. So these are standard patterns of making more things out of fewer. Reduction is just the opposite. You've got many things, and you want a smaller number of things. Examples are you've got a bunch of numbers and you want to find their sum, or you want to find the largest value or the smallest value, or uh, their product, that kind of thing. You might want to, given a matrix, find the sum over every row. So you aren't getting a single value, but you're getting a smaller number of values out. These are examples of reduction. The third case is permutation, where the amount of data isn't getting bigger or smaller, but the data is being rearranged. So examples of that are passing a piece of data to the nearest neighbor within a grid whether it be two-dimensional or three-dimensional or whatever. It might be an irregular permutation in a finite element analysis. Uh, each process might be passing some data to its neighbors, but the pattern isn't particularly regular, although it is still local. Or it might be just completely wild, uh, driven by the content of the data. A good example of that is sorting. The very purpose of sorting is to permute the data. So you can't tell ahead of time what the pattern is going to be. That's the point of the sort. And then the fourth kind is parallel prefix. That, like permutation, it puts out as much data as it takes in. But like replication and reduction, it's got the property that each of its inputs contributes to many outputs, and each output depends on many inputs. And that's a very complicated pattern, which you might think ought to be primitive, except that it's a little bit tricky to synthesize out of the others, and it turns out to be extremely useful. So we've thrown it in anyway. And I throw that in in the same spirit that someone managed to prove that you really don't need if then else if you've got while do, because if you, if you use enough extra temporary flags, you can sort of make a conditional out of the, out of the loop. But it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Much better to have this, this uh, set be not quite minimal. In parallel programming, this won't be the set of, of primitives that I propose won't be the only things you want to use. You'll want library routines on top of that to support things like regular grids, stencils. Uh, the concept of fetch with add doesn't quite fit to the framework. That might be a useful primitive. Uh, things, things like sorting and fast transforms are the most complicated. You would certainly want in your standard bag of tricks. And then there will always be things that don't fit in the standard bag of tricks. And exceptional situations will occur, and there does need to be an escape hatch underneath. And that escape hatch, I think, is message passing, the ability to, to take one da data item and send it from here to there. And that's analogous to the go-to. It's a way of taking control and sending it from here to there in an arbitrary way. And so I think message passing is the go-to of data parallel programming in a couple of ways. One is that it's the lowest level uh, trick of last resort when you can't do it in any more structured way. The second thing is that message passing is actually a good way to build a piece of hardware. 
Back in the 70s, when structured programming first became big, hardware designers tried designing hardware architectures that had these three primitives as sort of the primitive instructions of the machine. And the machine went to an awful lot of trouble to save and restore the necessary state whenever you entered one of these constructs to sort of do things under the table so you couldn't write an unstructured machine language program. These architectures turned out to be real disasters. And the reason is because branch instructions, that is the go-to, is just a cheaper way of building hardware. And that's OK, because you can let the compiler take care of the problem of bridging what was then called the semantic gap between the high-level programming languages and the low-level hardware mechanisms. And the fact you've got a compiler in there actually gives you more flexibility to do optimizations. That actually turns out to be the, the best way to go. And I think the same will come to be true of parallel programming. Uh, message passing is a very good primitive to have down at the hardware level, and that's what we've built into the CM5. And there's room for the compiler to do optimization in taking these primitives and rearranging them and taking a piece of this one and a piece of this one and, and uh, mapping it down to the lowest level. OK, so much for a very long and involved analogy. But I think it's true. The point of all this philosophy about, about a high-level view of what it's like to program a parallel machine is that viewed from this level, the CM5 provides a smooth evolution from the CM2. Although the hardware is radically different, the programming style is very much the same. The hardware is very different. The hardware is much more complex in the CM5 than in the CM2. It's more general in a number of ways, and it's more balanced. But the high-level programming model is identical. Uh, it, the CM5 supports data parallelism more completely because it has, it has a NIMD architecture rather than SIMD architecture. We can take in more advantage of some flexibility from the data parallel model that we couldn't on a SIMD architecture. But the CM5 is completely compatible with the existing level of existing CM2 high-level languages. I have been told that we've taken several hundred Fortran programs from the CM2 and simply recompiled them and dropped them on the CM5. And they work, and they work efficiently. And I think that's a, that's a, uh, a very good record. And I think we can expect that kind of performance to continue in the future. Furthermore, we have found ways by improving the compilers to take advantage of some of the NIMD capabilities of the machine for codes that were written for the CM2. So we actually can look forward to improved performance on old CM2 codes as the compilers get better. So I want to say about the CM5 that every architectural feature is there for some reason. As complicated as it is, I showed you that big, long diagonal list of all the hardware buzzwords about things that were used in the machine, techniques. But every one of them is there for one of four reasons. To support high-performance data parallel programs, because continuity from the CM2 is very important. Or to support multiple users because we think being able to time share and space share this machine is extremely important, to enhance system availability, or to be general enough to support other programming models, other parallel programming models. Because while the data parallel model uh, does indeed look very attractive, it's not necessarily the end all and be all. And we want to leave lots of room for experimentation. So let's look at some of those other programming models. The CM5 hardware is, in fact, general enough to support message passing, as on Intel and NCube machines. It also supports a model of, of, of using task queues with asynchronous workers, where you use one or some small number of the processing nodes to maintain queues of tasks, and use all of the others, a much larger number, as workers that are dispatched. And as each worker finishes one task, it reports its results and asks one of the task monitors for another task from the queue. Notice the interesting mixture of, comp of cooperative and, and competitive programming. We are using task masters to cooperate with the workers in solving what is actually a competition for tasks on the task queue. And so, that, so one finds a hybrid of techniques coming into play there. Because the CM5 can support so many different models of parallel computation, we find that software is easily ported from other parallel machines, not just the CM2. We have, in fact, taken several programs from an N-cube and, you, and uh, rewritten them slightly so as to use a different different lowest level message passing library, we drop them on the CM5, and they work. And that's great. Oliver Ryan tells me that he's ported a lot of programs from the um, Intel Hypercube. And uh, he, he, he says that however big the program, he has to change one line of source code. I think that's, the, that's probably an include statement, include a different subroutine library. And he drops it on the CM5, and it works. So, so software can be ported from other machines. This also means that the CM5 can possibly be used as a development machine, from which you can then port software back out to those other machines again, because you can program in the styles of the other machines. Well, it's interesting enough that you can run programs written in different programming styles. It's even more interesting that you can integrate different programming styles in the same program. And this is something we're working on. This is still work in progress. 
we're integrating the other models into the data parallel framework so that from the middle of a data parallel pro program, you can drop down to a lower level and write, for example, some crucial subroutine using, using message passing or using some other model. Subroutines called from data parallel programming can use the CMMB message passing library directly. In fact, this is the way we're implementing some of our library routines. And we're going to continue research on how to use multiple parallel models in different parts of a single program. It's also the case that even if the different programming models are in different programs, we can still time share within a single partition. Different programs written in very different parallel programming styles and expect them to cohabit uh, smoothly uh, without interference. All of these models can run simultaneously in the same partition. The reason this works is because the operating system is completely oblivious to the style of programming being used. SIMD, MIMD, TASQ, it doesn't matter. The hardware supports all the styles. The operating system can time share those things without needing to know what the program is doing. So let's return to this question. Not so much of are we a SIMD company or a MIMD company, but is the CM5 SIMD or MIMD? A slight variant on the question. And the answer is yes. I think the answer, is, as, as, and this is not an idea original to me, this is something I got from Danny. The SIMD versus MIMD battle is essentially over in both sides of one. As is usually the case when experts in a field are pretty evenly divided and stay divided for a long time, it usually means that both sides are right, but they're looking at different parts of the problem. There are advantages to SIMD architectures, and there are advantages to MIMD architectures, and finally in the CM5 we've managed to combine the advantages of both. And so I claim that the CM5 is in fact both. The battle is over. We should just declare it over and go on to the next thing. The CM5 transcends the issue by integrating the features of both SIMD and MIMD machines. This allows us to provide two kinds of portability. First, the CM5 hardware runs all kinds of parallel software. This is a point I've already touched on. The other thing is that CM5 parallel software can be run on all kinds of hardware. By this, I mean that it appears that the data parallel programming model, if you write a program in such a way that it's good, good as a data parallel programming, in fact, given appropriate compiler technology, that's a suitable way to organize a program for any kind of architecture that we've seen so far. And that specifically includes serial machines and vector machines and shared memory machines, as well as uh, the distributed memory MIMD and SIMD architectures that we've been working on. The reason is that data parallel programming tends to emphasize indicating in the program to the compiler what parts of the computation are independent of each other. And this is information that is useful to a compiler no matter what the target architecture. If you're on a sequential machine, it's helpful to know that successive iterations of a loop are independent of each other. On a vector machine, it's helpful to know that the, that the elements of a vector are independent, and therefore you don't have to worry about storing things back to memory and reloading them and that kinds of thing. On a shared memory architecture, to get speed, even the shared memory architectures usually use local caches in order to speed up memory access. So then you've got the problem of either solving cache coherency or the fact that you've really got distributed caches even though the main memory is shared. Indicating that different parts of the problem and their data are independent helps the compiler for a shared memory machine to distribute the data so you get good cache performance. And of course, it certainly helps on a distributed memory machine. So we have some hope that the data parallel strategy for organizing a program will provide portability across different styles of architectures in the same way that using high-level programs provided portability among the same kinds of architectures from different vendors. So we're hoping that this notion of scalable software will help to complete the picture of portability and allow one to write a single program, a single application that will run on, on processors of different sizes, of different styles from different vendors. Now I'd like to summarize in a chronological way this company's progress in understanding parallel machine design. This is the progress of the connection machine. We understand how to make many thousands of processors cooperate. We understood that back in 1988. And we understood how to do it on real world scientific and research applications the next year. Running programs in standard languages based on Fortran and C the next year, using both SIMD and MIMD hardware techniques, that's what we've developed in the past year in the CM5, and we can do this in systems that scale over three orders of magnitude, from less than a gigaflop to more than a teraflop. And that's, that's a potential right now, and it's something that may be achieved, if not in 1992, then probably in 1993. It's just a matter of doing it. Now I want to switch gears completely. I would like to show you 12 technical advantages of the CM5 over anything that's been done to date. I'm going to do them in countdown order. Here's technical advantage number 12. 
there's no microcode in the machine. All the performance and the functionality in the CM5 can be achieved from user level code. Most of it can be written in C or Fortran. From C or Fortran, you can get at a lot of low level mechanisms of the networks and all the things the user program should be able to do. At worst, you might have to descend to assembly language, but it's not necessary to write microcode or anything really grungy. We can expose the entire piece of hardware to a user program, and the user program can, can have access to all of the performance that's uh, available there in the hardware. That's a big advantage. Technical advantage number 11. CM5 put this in the 64-bit league. A lot of customers have told me that any computer that only operates on 32-bit words isn't real. OK, and I think that's a, a slightly extreme view. But it is true that most real computers are 64 bits wide, and a lot of scientific applications really need 64-bit floating point, as we and many other people discovered, not just 32-bit. The CM5 has 64-bit floating point arithmetic. It has 64-bit integer arithmetic, which is an improvement over the CM2. Even more important, it has 64-bit memory access paths. On every clock tick, every floating point unit can get a 64-bit operand from memory. There are 64-bit pointers in the machine. If you compose 32 bits of network address with 32 bits of memory address, you've got a 64-bit pointer that can, that can identify any byte throughout the machine. So the address space is no longer limited to 32 bits. And finally, the file system supports files larger than 2 to the 32 bytes. And as the data sets for our customers get bigger and bigger, well, we're already finding that, that a 32-bit file length is a limitation. So in every way, way that it seems to be interesting, the CM5 is squarely a 64-bit machine. Technical advantage number 10. We are using off-the-shelf processor technology as well as off-the-shelf memory technology. This allows us to ride on the industry technology curve rather than having to constantly redesign processors ourselves. We as a company do best by adding value where we are expert and by standing on the shoulders of giants rather than on their toes, as someone once said, in the areas where we are not. By using off-the-shelf Spark technology, this lets us not only take advantage of many other companies that are designing good implementations of, of processors, but allows us to take advantage of lots of existing software as well for the Spark. As risk processors improve, we will follow this curve, and we may be able to take advantage of other processor architectures besides the Spark if the opportunities arise. We are taking care to write most of the system software in C, and we're hoping that will give us relative portability as, as uh, the different families of CM5 uh, emerge using different processor technology. Also note that the existing CM5 vector units, while they do reside on a custom chip, are make, taking advantage of an off-the-shelf ALU and register file uh, modules. So uh, we don't want to be, as a company, in the business of designing floating point units because we are not, at least not yet, expert at that, unless better let somebody else do that. And I think we have a company that's gotten very good at taking taking advantage of and making use of the excellence of other companies as well as our own excellence and synthesizing them in an optimal way. Technical advantage number nine. Processors, I.O., and network are decoupled. Separating the design and implementation in these three areas is, it gives us great flexibility now in configuring the machine and will give us lots of flexibility in the future as we redesign the machine uh, in future generations. In the CM2, the amount of I.O. you had was strictly limited by the amount of processing power you had because the, the I.O. connections into the backplane were limited by the, amount, by the numbers of processors plugged in there. Similarly, the network is tied very closely to the processors being implemented on the same chip. We've decoupled all of that. Most of this is thanks to the use of a standard network interface chip. You've got the network on one side and everything else is on the other, and you can choose however much you want of the other stuff, and then you build a network big enough to span it all. This is a big technical improvement. This, this also allows us to change the network technology without changing the I.O. or the processors and vice versa. Technical advantage number eight. The design of the data network provides good performance for irregular communications. This is a problem we had with the CM2 hypercube. When a pattern of communication like a regular grid matched the hypercube structure exactly, then performance was really great. If you mismatched even slightly, performance could drop off by quite a bit. The data network in the CM5 has the property that the worst case can never be worse than a factor of four off the best case. And in fact, for lots of patterns, you do significantly better than the worst case. The design of the data network rewards locality. Being local is good, but it's not necessary to be regular to get good performance. And this is important because we're, we're encountering more and more applications area that require local but irregular communications. Another advantage of this design is that since the data network supports arbitrary permutations, 
this allows general striping in the, in the file system that supports the I.O. And this general striping facility allows us to support transfer of data between one group of processors and another group of processors that has a different number, or between different I.O. devices. Or you can copy data from 27 disks onto 14 tape drives, and it all works. And this is, this is thanks to the generality of the data network, primarily. Technical advantage number seven. The CM5 networks are scalable. They scale in length so that you can connect thousands or tens of thousands of things to the network. But even more important, as they scale in length, they scale in width to match. So that the amount of bandwidth that is provided to each network port is a constant. Every processing node or every IO, dev IO device that is connected to the network is guaranteed five megabytes per second per network address that is used by that item. And this is a significant technical achievement because it means that big systems are not going to find the network to be a bottleneck. That was a very important piece of the design, and I think we got that one right. Technical advantage number six, the CM5 has two networks. This is important. Other machines have usually tried to use a single communications network to solve all the communications problems of the machine. As we discovered, there are different kinds of communications, and they call for very different hardware solutions to be effective. So we have two networks in the machine. We have a data network that's designed for point-to-point -point transfer. Each item is only coming from one place and going to one, to one place, but it can do tens of thousands of them simultaneously. And then on the other hand, there are the multi-way interaction kinds of communication, broadcasting, reduction, uh, interrupting all processors in the system at once, gathering of, of error information, uh, reporting diagnostic information. And that kind of thing is handled by a separate mechanism in the control network. This, by the way, is the answer to the question that was asked on the title slide. What is the sound of one network clapping? Not much. It takes two networks to make the system work. Technical advantage number five. The networks, the control network and the data network, are user accessible. They are designed in such a way that user mode code is capable of exercising all of the non-privileged functions of the network. This means that the different processors that are operating on user tasks can exchange data and do broadcasting and reduction everything without having to call the operating system. That means that communications doesn't require system calls. It has no operating system overhead. And this considerably improves the performance of code on the CM5. Technical advantage number four. We solve the naughty problems of time sharing on parallel nodes. Many parallel machines, including the CM1 and the CM2, provided for a division of the machine into sections, and then a user task could run on each section. And this we call space sharing, or perhaps more correctly called space slicing. But we solved the problems of time slicing as well. The CM2 provided a dry run for that. We've got time sharing working on the CM2. It's a little bit awkward. The CM5 was designed from the ground up to support time sharing with all the necessary security mechanisms and efficiency mechanisms to enable switching of user context, swapping of user, user, user tasks, that kind of thing. And there are numerous technical details involved in the solution to that. Particularly, given that the user has direct access to the network, there's a problem of what if a user program, perhaps one with a bug in it, fills the network up with messages, isn't yanking them out of the network, and then it's time to switch users. It's time to run another user under time sharing. There was a very difficult technical uh, problem of getting the user state out of the network quickly so it could be saved and you can go on to the next user. And then there's yet another technical problem of once, when you want to start up that user with a buggy program again, you've got to restore that clogged network state. And those, those were uh, some uh, significant technical problems. And uh, this is an important technical achievement that I feel very safe in bragging about because I had nothing to do with the design of that. And I've got great admiration for the engineers who solved that problem. Technical advantage number three, there are a lot of reliability features in the machine. There are circuits throughout the machine that are constantly monitoring its behavior making sure that it's uh, behaving properly. There's error checking on all the memory accesses. There's parity checking on all the I.O. There are cyclic redundancy checks on all the communications across every wire as it's transferred. And those are constantly monitored as the machine is running. The diagnostic network also provides uh, provision for isolating faults. Once a faulty component has been found, it can be isolated and then diagnosed or replaced. You can power down the backplane containing the faulty component while the rest of the system continues to run serving users. And this is an important advance in the design of parallel processing systems. The system as a whole keeps going, even though part of it is broken. Technical advantage number two is that I.O. is scalable. The I.O. is connected into the data network rather than directly to the processors. And because 
The I.O. connections are un entirely unrelated to the processors, which means that you can choose the number of I.O. connections to be as large as you like, and then you build the data network to match. This gives the CM5 unprecedented I.O. capacity and uh, expansion uh, capacity. Finally, technical advantage number one. Partitions and I.O. traffic don't interfere. And this is something that I think we got really, really right in the CM5 that might have been hard to do with any kind of other network, particularly a hypercube or a grid. The problem is that you, if you carve up the machine into pieces, and you've got users, uh, one user is using this group of processors, and one user is using this group of processors, and one user is using this group of processors, and then you've got I.O. devices over here. And this user task needs to get data from that I.O. device. The question is, how do the messages flow through the system? With the design of the data network in the CM5, those messages don't go through the intervening partitions. They go up and over them. And the result is that traffic between distant parts of the system doesn't interfere with and is not impeded by stuff going on in the middle parts of the system. And this is very important to, to provide a, a, a smooth processing of a mixed job load. The CM5 has a bunch of new features. I outlined a list of the technical advantages for you, I think particularly with its I.O. extension capability. We've understood processor performance quite a bit all along. But now that I think we're matching that with a good story on I.O., we have the potential, if we continue to work hard and do it right, to build a product that will really change the world in computing a little bit.